the Freedom Pack podcast. I am awesome, awesomely excited to be with you guys. Thank you so much for having me on, John Lewis. Amazing. Thanks so much for joining us from right across the ocean. And uh, you have just created this amazing book. It's called Fanocracy. Lewis and I were very lucky to get a pre-release book of it. The book is out at the start of January. We will, of course, save this for when this interview goes live then the book will also be live simultaneously. So Lewis and I, we actually had an introduction to this idea of creating fans through Kevin Kelly when we interviewed him uh, a few months back, three or four months back. back. Yeah. So have have you heard of Kevin Kelly and his thousand true fans? I've heard, yeah, I've heard the concept. Absolutely. Yeah. So Kevin sort of had this, this approach of, it was quite a, an overarching, quite a, a, a vague concept in, in a sense, you know, a sort of just a market to hit. Whereas in fanocracy, I mean, you've really delved, you've delved in deep, you've got neuroscientists, you've got case <laughs> studies, you've, you've really taken it to a, you know, to an exceptional level. So just to jog our audience memories, we do have some uh, prior experience to this concept. So, if you could, David, could you please just describe, you know, what a fanocracy is and I suppose why someone would want to build one? Sure. So um, we looked at this idea of how and why people become fans. And then we realized that um, the idea of having a massive fan base is really, really important for businesses. And in particular, having a fan base that's eager to talk about you. And we recognized that it's almost like a form of government, if you will. And that's why we chose the word fanocracy. It's a it's a made up word. Um, we wanted to have something where you we could have the URL. So www.fanocracy.com. But a democracy is the rule of um, of the people. And a monarchy, of course, is the rule of the royals. A fanocracy is the rule of fans. And um, the organizations that allow their fans to take over, in a sense, are the ones that generally do really well. So we look at a fanocracy as an organization or a person or an idea that inspires true passion for a brand and it puts the the customer's needs ahead of everything else. So what would some of the characteristics of a of a someone that is within a fanocracy be? So in the terms of of the participants like we uh, I keep saying we because I wrote fanocracy with my daughter um, and she's now 26 years old, but when we first started to write, she was 21. And the, what we looked at was, we first said, you know, this whole online world that we're living in is becoming increasingly polarized, and there's so much going on. You know, the social networks are, you know, if you don't pay them, they won't show your stuff. I mean, it's really become kind of digital chaos. But at the same time, both Reiko and I, we're really passionate about the things that we love. So I'm really into live music. I've been to 790 live music shows. She's really into Harry Potter. Um, she's seen uh, every movie multiple times, read every book multiple times, went to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter theme park in Florida several times, uh, went to the UK because she wanted to go to the studio where they filmed the Harry Potter um, movies. And she wrote a 90,000 word alternative ending to the Harry Potter Potter series, put it on a fan fiction site, uh, and her story, um, Draco Malfoy is a spy for the Order of the Phoenix, Um, and it's gotten thousands of downloads and hundreds of comments. So we both recognize that we are so passionate about the things that we love, and we interviewed hundreds of people about what they're passionate about, and it turns out that people are so excited about these things that they love for a one particular primary reason. And that is because the people that they share that passion with, 
they become really close to it. They become among their best friends. So um, the friends I have that I go to live music shows, they're my best friends. You know, we, we love to go to shows together. We share the same lingo. Um, and, and, and the same thing is true of any group of fans. So um, the main characteristic is that it's a true human connection. It's a true human connection between people who share a fandom and then the companies that can tap into it, they're having a true human connection between the company and the fans and allowing the fans to have a connection to one another. When it comes to fans, I said the example I'll give is, is this podcast. If we were looking at our audience, how do we distinguish the difference between, say, a fan and a, and a listener? And what is the benefit of having the fan over the listener? Wow, that's a really probing question. Thank you, Lewis. So um, the way I look at it is that a fan is somebody who wants to know about you. Who is Lewis? Who is Joe? Who are, well, who are these people? What are, they, what are they like on their off time when they're, not in, when they're not in front of the microphone? What do they love to do? Um, a, a fan is someone who's eager to share that they love the podcast. They're eager to tell their friends, you got you to gotta listen to these guys. They're, they're smart, they're interesting, and they're providing valuable information for people. So um, a fan is someone who digs deeper and who makes what you're creating a part of their life as opposed to just, oh, yeah, you know, I got to drive um, for an hour. You know, let's see if I can find a podcast to, to, to occupy my time. No, they're eager for the next episode. Um, they perhaps communicate with you with, on social networking. And they're so happy to be able to share in what you love. And um, it becomes a mutual relationship, even if you've never met one another, even if you don't even know that that person is a fan. David, what is it? Because I know that you have this amazing, uh, real scientific approach to quantifying things. So what <laughs> is it that you are specifically a, a true fan about? I'm a real big fan of three or four things. Um, and yeah, thank you for saying quantify because I, I am kind of geeky about that way. I mentioned live music. I saw my first live music show when I was 15 years old. Um, that happened to be Aerosmith at Madison Square Garden in New York City. But the second live show I saw was the Ramones and they played at my high school, <laughs> which is remarkable. That was in 1976. You guys weren't even born then. Um, and then, um, I've seen 790 live music shows since then. Um, I'm also a massive geek about the Apollo Lunar Program. And I love the fact that we sent humans to the moon in the 1960s using this rudimentary technology. And I became a real massive fan of that. And the quantification there is I've met more than half of the men who walked on the surface of the moon. Um, and I actually have... Uh, a collection of artifacts of things that have flown to the moon. Um, so real geeky about that. And I'm also a massive fan of surfing. I'm not a very good surfer. You know, no one would ever see me surf and say I'm good, but I love it. I love to surf. And, um, you know, I, I've surfed in something like 15 countries, so I kind of geek out about, <laughs> about that. And, and again, the people who share those things with me are people who have become my close friends um, because we share that together, um, that, 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 those fandoms. I know a lot of people like you and, and myself who find it quite easy to get you know, drawn into a fandom. And I know people that sort of, they distance themselves from that sort of thing and, and they don't really get passionate about things. They don't become true fans. Is there anything, is there any underlying reason within our brains or anything like that that makes some people, it, it's easier for them to become a fan than, say, another person. Is there any underlying reason? Interesting. Um, we have not been able to uncover what an underlying reason might be. 
But we did some interesting research to learn. We, we, we looked, we, we spoke with and did um, some um, analysis of about, I think we're up to 3,500 people now, over 3,000 people um, of number one, how many fandoms do they have that they're really passionate about? I mean, not, not a sort of a superficial one, but something that they're really passionate about, that they're, they spend significant time and or money on, that they have really strong friendships around. And it turns out the average is two and a half. But what's really interesting is 5% of the people who we um, did this research with of over 3,500 people, 5% have zero fandoms. So that's kind of what you're describing, Lewis, is people who feel as though they're not passionate about anything. That's 5% of people. And here's another set of data. We also asked people of the thing that you're most passionate, and for me, that would be going to live music shows. When did you start? At what age did you start? And for me, it was age 15. It turns out the average is around 12 or 13 years old. And here's the reason we believe that this is true. In our society today, we no longer have coming of age ceremonies for most of us. But throughout human history, there's been coming of, coming of age ceremonies where when somebody reaches puberty, the adults in the community figure out a way to have a ceremony to make them part of the adult world. And in fact, some of the primitive cultures that still is, exist do that. Uh, we visited one in Panama where it's a, a village called Kangandi in Cunayala, Panama, where they have no electricity, no running water. They live in grass huts. They still have coming of age ceremonies. Um, and so we believe that when you become fan of something at an early age, it's almost never something that your parents are a fan of. Um, many times there's a, a, a small element of danger to it. And that those things that you become fan of, fans of with your peers as, a, as you're reaching puberty is a substitute for, um, for a coming of age ceremony. And I know I'm getting very philosophical here, but, um, but, but this is something we, we learned. And so for those 5% of people who don't have a fandom, what we suggest is think about what it is that you loved to do when you were 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, maybe one of those things that you love to do at that age, you can rekindle the passion for and then have that become something that you're a fan of as an adult. Do you think that something in that sort of age range could be that for maybe the first five six seven or so years of your life you follow a very specific route from your parents where you your identity is almost completely in their control and then as you sort of get a little bit older you have a little bit more freedom and then i suppose that you have the choice then to sort of build a slight piece of identity capital outside of your parents image could that be a particular reason i think you're absolutely right and I think that's exactly what's going on is that people are uh, young people are saying, um, I can make a choice for myself. You know, like my parents wanted me to do, say, football or my parents wanted me to um, learn how to play the piano. But once I um, once I get to be that age, 12, 13, 14 years old, I want to make decisions for myself and I want to do something that I can share with my friends. And then they people of all over. And we, we looked at people at all different countries and it's very consistent. Make a choice that they're going to choose something to do on their own. And that choice often is something that they remain passionate about for their entire lives, which is so interesting. You know, the idea that you, you, you become passionate of something about something when you reach puberty around that age, and then you still love to do it 20, 30, 40, 50 years later. Yeah. You know, the, the other thing I suppose of this fandom is uh, when I was in university and I used to attend psychology lectures, we know the power of being in a group setting. And we also know, I mean, it was Robert 
Cialdini writes about in Influence, the enormous power of social proof and, you know, we like what other people like. What we noticed with this podcast was that going from, say, zero to, uh, say, 10,000 listens was probably harder than going from 10,000 to 100,000 listens. Right. And we think, well, we well, we guessed was, was that as soon as p- the word of mouth started to catch on. So how important is that sort of feeling of belonging? As in, you know, you sort of belong to a group of people with the sh- same sort of, maybe maybe even goals, maybe, maybe goals in that uh, instance. Um- I think it's really important for all humans. And, you know, you, you mentioned the psychology lectures in university. Um, I, we became fascinated with the idea of the neuroscience of what's going on in your brain when you become fan of something. And my co-author and daughter, Reiko, did a neuroscience degree in university. She went to Columbia University in New York, and she's now in her final year of medical school. She's going to be a doctor next year. And so she has a neuroscience background. And then we interviewed several different neuroscientists about what's going on in the brain. And it turns out that we humans have hardwired in our brains that the closer we get to somebody the more powerful the shared emotion. The closer we get to someone, the more powerful the shared emotion. And one neuroscientist in particular, his name is Edward T. Hall, identified that there's four zones of proximity. The first zone is called public space, further than about 20 feet away. And in public space, our ancient human brains and our DNA, we don't track the people who are further than 20 feet away from us. We know they're there, but we don't track them. We don't worry about them. When people become closer than about 20 feet, our ancient brain kicks in because we want to know, are we in danger? Is the person that's within 20 feet of us somebody who um, is a friend or is someone who might be an enemy. And the next level is called personal space. That's within four feet. That's sort of a cocktail party distance. So when you enter a room and there's a number of people who are in your social space between about four and 20 feet away, you can't help the fact that you track those people. And so if you get into a crowded elevator, you don't know those people, you sometimes feel uncomfortable or I should say a crowded lift, you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> and, it, and if you go into a room with your friends, you feel really positive um, emotional connections because you know those people. And so um, this idea has a very strong basis in fandom because when you become part of a tribe, a group of people who are fans um, or a company can create a tribe of people around um, their product or service or idea who become fans, or you create a group of people who become fans of you. If there is a close physical proximity, that can be really powerful. I don't know if you've done it, but there's some podcasters um, who have had real big success by sometimes recording episodes live with a, with an audience. Um, have, you, have you ever done that before? We've never done it. We definitely will at some stage. So definitely. what's cool about that is there's a neuroscience background to it because if you're bringing your fans together with you in social space, in other words, you get within 20 feet of those people, even if it's just in the meet and greet afterwards, Um, then they are becoming much more powerful fans because their brain says, I now know this person, this is really powerful. So there's actually a neuroscience reason for why you might want to increase your fanocracy just by figuring out a way, you know, you maybe just rent a room in a pub or something and bring people together to record an episode. And there's actually another form of neuroscience that's actually that, that you're actually already doing. And that's called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are the part of our brain that fire 
when we see somebody doing something as if we're doing it ourselves. And so I'm going to demonstrate that for you right now. I've got a lemon and people who are just listening can't see, but if you're watching on YouTube, you can see this. I've got a lemon in one hand and a slice of lemon in my other hand. If I take a bite of this lemon, it's really strong. It makes my eyes scrunch up. My mouth sort of puckers up. My saliva glands start to go into action. You know, I, it's a really strong sensation. My brain is lighting up when I take a bite of the lemon. But just by seeing me, and even just by hearing me, I'm going to guess that both you, Joe, and Lewis are, are, are experiencing through your brain as if you've taken a bite of that lemon, too. I felt my face scrunch up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. And even people li who are only listening have might have had that experience as well. That's through mirror neurons. That's why if you go to a, a sad movie, you feel sad. If you go to a thriller movie, you, you, you know, your heart starts to beat. You know, it's just a movie. It's not you, but mirror neurons are firing as if it's you. So here's where that comes in about what we're doing right now. We're recording a podcast, but we're also on video. Now, what we're doing is we're cropping this video very cleverly, both of us, or all three of us, two cameras. We're cropping the video as if we're in the personal space of each other. It's as if we're in cocktail party distance. It's as if, I mean, you're, you're 3,000 miles away from me. I'm in Boston, you're in Wales, but it's as if we're in the same room by the use of the video. And through mirror neurons, our brains fire as if we are in the same room together. So this is a way that any one of us can build fans by cleverly using video and photographs uh, to show us in context to the people that are our fans and they bond with us through this concept of mirror neurons, our ancient brains kick in and saying, I like these guys. These people are people I know and trust and enjoy. And that's a very powerful human connection. Most of us don't use video and audio video and uh, photographs effectively, but you do. We are we the three of us are doing that right now. And that's really powerful stuff. Is that why things like selfies and whatnot are so effective? Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny with selfies because so many people um, dismiss the selfie as frivolous. And, you know, that's just for kids. And, you know, I wouldn't take a selfie, but they're really powerful because your arm, by definition, is within personal space. If you take that selfie, you're looking directly at the camera. It's cropped as if that person is next to you. Um, and if there's more than one person in the selfie, the people's heads are close together and they're looking at the camera. That indicates from a neuroscience perspective that those people are aligned, also really powerful. Um, so um, we dug into this neuroscience and found it to be fascinating and um, are all of this are prescriptions for how any one of us can build fans and you're already doing it you're doing it naturally you did it before you read the book you're doing these ideas naturally so let, let me know when you when you record an episode in the pub i'd be interested to see uh to hear you know what your fans because you'd be surprised who might show up people you don't you've never known that are your followers you know really excited to meet you in person it's interesting that we get on to uh, this topic because I've heard that you've said one of the driving forces for you writing this book is the fact that the pendulum of business has swung too far in the way of superficial online communication, where in fact people are actually crying out for genuine human connection. I wonder if you could paint a contextual picture of what the modern business landscape looks like in regards to the superficial communication and lack of human connection. So what so many organizations are doing is abusing the online channel. Um, that's the first thing is they're abusing that online channel. So for example, you buy something online and, and then you get on an email list 
and they're immediately trying to sell you something else. And they'll hit you again and again and again trying to sell something else um, in a non-effective way. They're not building a fan, you as a fan. They're just trying to sell you something else. Or um, if you connect with someone on a social network, they'll immediately try to sell you something. Or um, the social networks themselves, Facebook especially, are creating polarized environments. You know, in my country, our presidential election was swung because of Facebook's polarization around the different supporters and um, and allowing Russian hackers to come in and swing the election to Donald Trump. Um, and so people feel isolated when the only people that they um, can see and hear are people who are exactly like them. So um, we feel that those are parts of what's going on with a typical company is that they're focused on this superficial connection. But also a typical company doesn't really get into the humanity so much. You know, you, you call them on the telephone and they say, you know, due to more calls than we normally get, you have to wait on hold. You don't get a person. Or, um, or they send you their marketing materials and rather than real people in the photographs, it's stock photos, it's models, you know, and, and it, on their websites, you can't even find a way to contact peop the, the company. So all of those, or, or they outright lie to you. All of those are, um, are things that companies are doing um, that actually distance themselves from fans and customers rather than trying to get closer to customers. Could I just ask, Dave, what would say an outright lie that that some custom that some businesses could be making that maybe they don't even like know? Because, for example, one I can think of is whenever I see testimonials, and I just see you know just a it it always looks you know it's just John or. Yeah, yeah <laughs> right. wonderful, great. Like I, I, I don't believe it personally. I don't believe those either. Yeah. I don't. The ones I believe, and these are the ones that all of us should be using, is a real photograph of a real person with their full name, maybe even their social network handle. Um, those are the ones that are believable. Um, I mean, the outright lies that people no longer believe that when companies tell them people just dismiss it is um, um, due to a higher than expected call volume. It'll take us longer to answer your call. You know, that th those things happen all the time. Or um, when a company is um, has a problem they blame that problem on something else like, oh, we're really sorry that we lost your credit card information, but it was because of the processing system we used. Well, you're the one who chose the processing system, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, the CEOs constantly, you know, try to hide behind the truth. And I think that organizations um, that tell the truth um, are able to build fans in a stronger way. Um, we were speaking a couple of moments ago before we started the show about KFC in the UK. You know, it's a wonderful example. Um, they ran out of chicken last year, which was, which was, what a ridiculous story, right? I mean, a, a chicken restaurant that ran out of chicken. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? And, and what they, and, and it turns out the reason they ran out of chicken is because they they um, went with a new logistics supplier, a new delivery system, and they weren't ready and they fouled up the deliveries. And so um, they what KFC could have done is blame it on that logistics company. But they didn't. They said, we screwed up. It's our fault that we screwed up. And then they created a, um, a website and some social media feeds where people could learn when the chicken would come back. And they ran a fun, um, you know, humorous advertising campaign to alert the public as to what was going on. And by telling the truth, they were able to not only keep the fans they already had, but actually grow more fans. But if they had done what most companies do and say, um, due to a situation beyond our control, 
um, the company we were using to supply our chicken wasn't able to make deliveries and we're going to try to get it as soon as we can. People are like, all right, fine, but why not just be honest with me? Yeah. If the world is, like you said, in fact, missing out on that genuine human connection, is there a case that those that maintain the old approach, they get left behind? And also, how big an advantage does that leave for the entrepreneurs and businessmen and organizations that still do try and seek that human connection with their audience? I think through all of the five years of research that we've done on this topic, that it's extremely rare for people and organizations to have this true human connection. Um, the vast majority do not. And so I, I don't know whether if we were to talk in 10 years, I don't know whether this is going to become such a trend that people will be left out who don't do it. But I don't feel that's where we are today. I think it's so rare that there's a tremendous opportunity for any organization that does. So I, I think of it much like I, I wrote a book called The New Rules of Marketing and PR originally came out in 2007. It was uh, one of the very first books in the world that talked about social media marketing before um, before anyone was really doing it in the corporate world. And so I remember that back then it was extremely rare for a company to have a Twitter feed uh, or for a company to have a blog. That was 13 years ago. Um, now, many, many companies have um, a social media feed or a YouTube channel or a blog. Um, and so now I think, you know, it's sort of you're left behind if you don't. But I think this idea of fandom is so new and the idea of true human connection is so new that it's a tremendous opportunity for those companies that do try to figure out how to do it for their business. You're clearly a wonderful thinker in business terms, uh, David. I wonder if you were to look into a crystal ball, maybe ten in 10 years time, as you just mentioned, but then you were to look into this crystal ball, what do you think some of the traits of a business in terms of how we're interacted with uh with its audience which of the traits do you think that maybe could happen today what could just simply be left behind like for example i think when you were given that kfc example and i loved the example in the book i mean we remember it very clearly when we were here for me and lewis as consumers i think that if, for example, there's a lack of transparency, like I remember, you know, there's that, that American, whole American Airlines, that whole saga, that was, a, you know, a real complete mess. I remember learning about that in business class. And, you know, I just remember thinking that I just don't think that that, that will stand for in the future. I'd love to know what your thoughts are on that, David. Yeah, you know, that's an it's an interesting observation. Um, if I were to get really philosophical, I would say if we were looking back, I don't know if it would take 10 years, it may take 30 years. But if we were to be looking back on this period in history, I think that this might be an outlier period. Here's what I mean by that. Our grandparents had human connections when we bought when they bought products you know our grandparents went to a store they more more they they likely knew the people who were at the store that sold them things um they if they were treated well they would go back to that store then we started to have big companies and it was uh, sort of a cold environment and you could buy products online and companies could deploy computer computer technology to reach people. And it was possible to do business with without having a, a personal connection anymore. And many companies ended up doing that. Um, but it left many people feeling cold and feeling as if they're missing something and feeling as though they're not not living their life in the way that that might be a better way to live it. And so I, I'm just wondering if 
I don't know if it's 10 years or 20 years, but some number of years in the future, we were to look back and say this period in history when Facebook is so polarizing, when companies are treating you poorly, when um, many times you can't even find a human to help you in a company is an outlier type of period in history and that we're going to all of us go back to human connections in the future. I don't know. Who knows? We may even go the other direction where everything becomes artificial intelligence and AI and robots and we don't have any human connection. But I hope we end up with a more human um, uh, way of living in the future. I really do. One of the core arguments I, I know you've received from some people is that they well, they think they're not in the business to get fans. Perhaps they're a, a business to business company, for example. Well, what would you say to that? We looked at so many different types of organizations. We looked at doctors. We looked at dentists. We looked at nonprofit organizations and charities. Um, we looked at software companies. We looked at B2B companies. And um, it turns out that every one of those categories, we were able to find examples of companies that have developed a fan base, that have created a true human connection. And, and I'll give you just two examples. So um, we found a dentist, his name is Dr. John Marashi, and Dr. Marashi um, has a fabulous Instagram feed where he shares his love of skateboarding. <laughs> so what he's done is he's sharing his passion with the world. He has um, last time I checked, he has 13,000 followers on Instagram. He's a dentist with 13,000 followers on Instagram. And so what's really cool is that he's been able to um, to develop a group of fans because he shares something about him pers himself personally. And, you know, most people would say to us, but, you know, David, I'm a dentist. I can't develop fans. Well, yeah, you can. If you share part of your personal life, if you show that you're someone who has passion. Um, the second example I'd like to share is Microsoft, the biggest company in the world. Um, you know, and many people assume they're, they're primarily a B2B company, assume that they can't develop fans at a company like Microsoft, but in fact they can. And one of the reasons why they've been able to do that is because um, one of the things we found in the idea of fanocracy is that once you put your product or service out in the world, it no longer belongs to you, it belongs to the fans. You know, once this podcast is released, it's no longer our podcast. It's the listener's podcast. Um, and so the organizations that recognize that and allow their fans to do with their products what the fans want to do are the ones that are more successful than the companies that try to control the way people use products and services. Now, where that comes into play in Microsoft is their largest sales channel by far is their partner channel. They have 350,000 partners around the world and, and it represents $95 billion in revenue. By far, the most revenue of Microsoft comes from this channel. And the partner channel, the partners communicate with one another and they solve each other's problems and they ask questions and answer questions among each other. And Microsoft is not even a part of that. There's the worldwide partner online community where people can engage and ask questions and answer questions. Microsoft, they lurk, but they don't jump in. So in other words, Microsoft is allowing their fans, in this case, their partners, uh, to take control. And that's not something that most companies like to do because it feels uncomfortable. I'll give you an example of the opposite. Um, Adobe makes Photoshop software. And my daughter, Reiko, my co-author in the book, um, is a real fan of making art using Photoshop. And she says that the other, her other friends who do the same thing are on these websites where they laugh at Adobe because Adobe tries to control the way that people talk about Adobe Photoshop software. They say, you cannot say that you Photoshopped something. Instead, you must say that you manipulated something 
using Adobe trademark R Photoshop trademark R software. <laughs> and so my daughter said, you know, everything that we say sounds like a fan. Everything that Adobe says sounds like a robot. And so I contrast that with Microsoft that says our partners control the community, not us. Whereas Adobe says we want to control. So I know you asked a simple question, Lewis, but it's a really long answer. But but we found every sort of business or person or idea has an opportunity to develop fans. I think for the people listening as well that may think, oh, you know, maybe it's a bit difficult in B2B. David even found insurance companies. <laughs> <laughs> and if an insurance company can, then I'm pretty sure that anyone can but just going through the book the one story i think david which just blew me away and this is more personal to yourself of course is let me take you back 12 or so years you drive about 10 or so miles down the road you head down to i think it was cambridge massachusetts yes um, you go to meet with uh, I think it was at the time of one of your book releases. You so yeah. you go down to lead, to meet you know a, a management team of about ten or so people. So tell me, I mean, how does a you know just a friendly meeting with a you know a seemingly low level management team end up with Brian Halligan, the CEO, the founder of of HubSpot? describing you as his long lost brother <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah this is a really cool story it's ex and you you tell you told the beginning bit well so um my book the new rules of marketing and pr came out in 2007 and brian and a couple of his business school buddies started hubspot in 2006 and one of the management team of hubspot read a copy of the new rules of marketing and pr and said wow, this guy is writing about marketing in the same way we're talking about marketing. At that time, HubSpot had no customers. Uh, they only had eight employees. Um, and so they said, David, we want you to come in and, and talk with us because the ideas in your book are the same ideas that we've been talking about in this company that we founded um, that has marketing software. And so I went and I pulled out my computer and this was in the first minute that I was in the meeting. I pulled out my computer to open it up to take some notes. And on the back of my computer, I had some stickers. I had a Japan sticker. I had a Nantucket Island sticker. I had a Grateful Dead sticker. And the Grateful Dead sticker actually looks just like that. It's a steal your face logo. And so Brian says, hang on, we can't start this meeting until you tell me about those stickers on your computer. So I said, well, that's a Japan sticker. I lived in Japan for seven years. My wife is Japanese. It's a very important place for me. And Brian said, I lived in Japan, too. What about the Nantucket sticker? And he, I said, I, I own a house in Nantucket. I love the place. I go all the time. Brian goes, I go every summer. And he says, like, we're like long lost brothers. We 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 both identified the future of marketing. You started a, a, you wrote a book. We started a company. We both go to Nantucket. We both lived in Japan. What about the Grateful Dead sticker? I said, they're my favorite band. I've at that time, I think I'd been there, been to like 30 shows. I've been to like 30 shows. Brian says, I've been to over a hundred Grateful Dead concerts. And so I actually had a spare ticket to a, a Grateful Dead show. Um, a couple of weeks later, I go, I have a spare ticket. Should we go together? And we went to the show together. And within a week, Brian invited, invited me to become um, the founding member of the HubSpot advisory board. Um, so now this is 13 years later as we're having this conversation now. And um, HubSpot now has 3,000 employees. They're going to do 650 million dollars in revenue in 2019. Um, they're public on the New York Stock Exchange. Their market capitalization is six billion dollars. Uh, I'm still on the HubSpot advisory board. Oh, wow. And Brian, Brian is, a, uh, is one of my best friends. We co-wrote a book called Marketing Lessons from the Grateful Dead together. And so here's the here's what this story, I think, shows. And the reason why I put it in the book is that the fact that I had a sticker on my computer meant that I had an instant bond with Brian. Uh, 
And if you didn't know what those stickers are, you would have just you would have it wouldn't have been anything negative. You just would have dismissed it. You know, OK, fine. He's got some stickers on his computer. Let's start the meeting. But for Brian and me, it showed that we're part of the same tribes, that we're people who share the same passions. And because of that, we had an instant connection in the very first minute that we met one another, we had three strong connections. And that led to me um, and Brian having a a really, really strong, um, I would call it a partnership over the last 13 or 14 years. And, um, And it's been really good for both of us. And that's what all of us can do because when we're passionate about something and we show our passion, It's incredibly powerful. The other thing that I would share about this is people say sometimes, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, people say, well, I'm, I can't build fans of my business. I, you know, I, I, I'm a nonprofit or I'm a, um, a, a lawyer or I'm, you know, whatever it is, but it turns out anyone can. And one of the reasons that I say that is because if you think about, walking around on a street, the, the, the things that people have as a logo on their ball cap or the thing that people have as a logo on their T-shirt. Right now I see a guest T-shirt and a stuffed swimwear T-shirt, um, right? P- we have logos of the things we love. And I've seen many, many, many people with logos of B2B companies, of logos of nonprofits, Yes, and also rock bands and sports teams. There's even an organization that I see a logo of all the time on T-shirts, on hats, on shirts, um, on, on people's computers, and it's a United States government agency. I checked on their Instagram, I think they're at 50 million followers. And on a Twitter, they're 30 million followers. It's a US government agency where millions of people outwardly express their fandom by wearing t-shirts, and that's NASA, right? They're a government agency with millions of fans. And that says to me, any one of us can develop fans. It also says, when you share the thing that you love, you're building an opportunity to bond with like-minded people. Wow, you know, I've, I've absolutely loved this conversation, uh, David. We appreciate that, that you run out of time and you go on another interview and you know, we, we feel mentally exhausted after one, so I can imagine what it's like um, to do them. So we just ask a couple of questions at the end just to wrap sure. things up. So of course. on a personal, I'm really curious to know, David, I mean, you've traveled to all these countries. What books have personally, uh, have personally been, you know, maybe a central point in your life or that have had an impact on you? So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about two. The first one is a book called Permission Marketing by Seth Godin. Seth Godin yeah. yeah, and I first read Permission Marketing right when it came out, which I believe would have been either would have been the late 1990s or very early 2000s. So it's about 20 years old. And Permission Marketing opened my eyes to the what marketing can be. Um, and since then I've read every book Seth has written. I've read every blog post he's written. I've listened to every podcast he's done. I've heard him speak live a couple of times. We've actually become buddies. Um, uh, he, he wrote an endorsement for the book, uh, Fanocracy. Um, the second really influential book for me is a book by David Byrne, who's the front man to the talking heads. And the book is called how music works. And it's got three parts to the book. It's a part memoir about his life in music as a member of the Talking Heads as well as a solo artist. And it's a part musical history going back hundreds of years about the history of music from his perspective. And it's a part how-to about how to be a music artist and be successful. And I loved the book because I'm not a music artist. I'm a fan of music, but I was able to learn so much and it became really influential in my life. 
What societal rules or societal norms do you love to break? Yeah, <laughs> a lot of them. <laughs> um, so, you know, one of the one of the ones that immediately come to mind, though, is my parent, my father was a traditional kind of father that went to work in an office at a big company. All of my parents' friends were people who went to work in offices at big companies. And the first 15 years of my life, I went to work in an office of a big company. And I got fired by Thomson Reuters in 2002. And I said to myself, wow, what am I gonna do now? So I, that's when I started what I'm, what I'm doing now. I started writing and speaking and, and doing some consulting. And, um, and so I feel like I broke a societal rule that you have to work, at least in, in the world I grew up in, where everybody who I knew and everyone who, who were the parents of my friends, everybody worked at companies. And it's not a rule per se, but it's sort of a norm that you grow up and you work at a company. And I've been happily unemployed for 17 years now. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the last question, which we've got for you, David, before we ask you to leave your social media handles and, and disclose the book and whatnot, is let's imagine a scenario in which you've traveled to all these amazing countries, you've got all these quantified spreadsheets on Excel, you have, you have really completed Microsoft Excel <laughs> or Evernote or whatever you use, and unfortunately your time is running out. You haven't got long left, but every person in the world is tuned into the same frequency, and you can share a short but impactful message with hypothetically every person listening. What would David's message to the world be? It's a that's a fascinating question, um, and I'm going to expand it a little bit, if you don't mind. Please. To talk about something that I think about a lot, which I call the rocking chair test. Have you ever heard of what the rocking chair test is? I don't think so. The the rocking chair test is um, when you're at the end of your life as you described, so I'd like to assume I'm going to be in my late 90s or early 100s. So let's say I'm 95 years old. I'm in my rocking chair on my porch, hopefully sipping a nice glass of red wine. And I think back to my life that I don't wanna have any regrets. And so far, um, I'm, very, I'm a long way from age 95. But so far, I don't have any regrets. And I don't want to ever have to look back and say, darn, I wish I had done that. I didn't, but I wish I had. So I would say, to answer your question, thinking about that rocking chair test is, I would say to everybody, you know, think about your own rocking chair. Think about when you're 95 years old or 105 years old and you look back on your life, can you look back on your life with no regrets? Because that's a life that's well lived. Wow, that's amazing. David, where can our audience connect with you? And should we assume that when the book is released, that it's just or where all books are sold? Or is there a special yeah. link? Yeah. Um, so um, we've got a site set up at www.fanocracy.com. There's videos and da things you can download and information about the ideas there in that site. On the social networks, I am DM Scott, D-M-S-C-O-T-T. -T. My full name, David Meerman Scott. I'm the only one on the planet. So if you Google that, you will get me and only me. Um, and the book... Um, is going to be out all over the world simultaneously i hope although print might be a little bit delayed in some countries i have learned that the uk should be available right away um, and it's um, available in ebook format print format and my daughter and i read the audiobook so it's also in an audiobook format that is amazing david this has been a, a pleasure you you are a you know a truly fascinating person and uh you know, I, I hope that you write another book so we can do Thank this you. again. <laughs> I would love to, I would love to do it again. And you know, here's what here's my challenge to you, uh, to all of us, me too. 
I would love to come on the show and do it live in a pub in Wales. So we should figure out how to, how to do that at some point. So let's make that a challenge to one of to ourselves that we will do this live and in person so we can meet with our fans. Um, but I really appreciate you having me on, Joe and Joe and Liz. This has been um, a really, really fun conversation and I appreciate it. The first glass of red wine will be on us, Stephen. <laughs> yeah, and, and whatever you're interested in, the second round will be on me. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on, David. We will, of course, send all the links and whatnot. The book will be out, 